Good afternoon, and welcome to the Higher Right webinar, Back to the Basics, DOT Drug and Alcohol uh, Drug and Health Screening. My name is Justin Reed. I am the Manager of Transportation Solutions here at Higher Right, and it's certainly my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. We recognize that it takes a lot of commitment to join us for this full hour and appreciate that you have the desire to learn more about this critical component of our compliance environment. Before we get started, a couple of key issues. The required legal notification, just be aware that what we will be covering today does pertain to compliance, and we do encourage you to engage with your own legal counsel before making decisions that might change your program or create any sort of compliance differentiation from where you're at today. Now, a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin the main content. You'll notice there is a control bar on your screen, and that has multiple icons for you. First of all, we have the Higher Right Resources button, which we encourage you to select that to read more about Higher Right products and services. We also have a question button. If you'd like to ask a question to the presenter today, we do encourage you to utilize that button. Today's content is quite heavy, so we may or may not have time at the end to address questions live. However, we will be engaging in responses to those questions uh, within the next several days via email. Finally, there is a survey option which will come up for you at the end of this presentation. Answer the questions in the survey for us because this is tremendously helpful as we plan for the next webinar with regard to content and process that we'll uh, engage with you on. Without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Todd Simo, Chief Medical Officer here at Higher Right and also Managing Director of the Transportation Vertical here at Higher Right. Dr. Simo, thank you for joining us today and giving us your time. I give you the floor, sir. No, I, I thank you, Justin, for that. And I'm going to get off this slide uh, fairly quick since uh, I've been told multiple times I do have the face for radio. So, you know, the agenda today is is really DOT drug testing. I'm not going to talk, much, uh, you know, really at all about the physical examination requirements. That may be a follow-up, you know, webinar where I address the nuances within the FMCSA DOT exam U.S. Coast Guard exam, and even a, a little bit about FAA pilots, because those are the, the three, you know, agencies that broadly falls under DOT, acknowledging Coast Guard as part of uh, Department of Homeland Security. But, you know, they all kind of feed from the same regulatory set. So we'll talk about DOT drug screening program, random program basics, best practices for post-accident and reasonable suspicion screens. Throughout the whole presentation, I'm going to be weaving all of the different uh, agency nuances. And then lastly, talk about the status of alternate uh, specimens. So again, getting to the DOT drug screening requirements. So, you know, first let's just acknowledge, you know, what the purpose of drug screening or a uh, drug-free workplace program is. And the, the really purpose, and really the purpose of the, you know, uh, 1991 Omnibus Transportation Act was to put a drug screening program in place that deters people from using, you know, illicit drugs or using drugs that could impact their ability um, to impact public safety. So again, deterrence is the, the key message. Now to get deterrence, you do have to have some form of detection. You know, you have to have a viable specimen that does detect use. Um, and, and hence why, you know, alternate specimens, you know, are, are being considered because the data shows that the urine program may not be as good as it was at the initi initiation of this. 
But again, it's a deterrence-based program. And the ultimate goal of any drug-free workplace program is to improve, you know, safety, number one, but also impact, you know, positively employee productivity and welfare, decrease absenteeism, and reduce overall, you know, a medical costs, whether it's health care insurance or workman compensation insurance. So the Obama administration, in its first term, actually did a great deal of work defining the cost that illicit drug use has on, you know, on industry as well as the United States as a whole. Within that study, uh, his administration showed that just in terms of lost productivity alone, illicit drug use, which did include THC, because THC remains illicit at the federal level, the marijuana, it, so it did include marijuana, that the impact was $81 billion to employers just based upon productivity. Then when you add in the costs of medical costs, workman compensation costs, employee turnover, um, and then brand protection, that number goes to over $190 billion. The National Institute of Drug Addiction says that there are 10, 10 million, 14 million illicit drug users that are actively in the workforce. So doing some pretty easy math, just with a lot of zeros, every time you detect a person who has a positive drug screen, you're saving your organization $14,000 a year. And when you detect them, you take some sort of employment act and removing them from duty, whether that's not hiring, firing, or rehabilitating. So now to the regulations. Every DOT agency um, and U.S. Coast Guard, you know, do drink from the tra- same trough uh, in regards to the general administration of their drug-free workplace program as part of that federal DOT drug screening program. And the regulation that weaves between all of the agencies is 49 CFR Part 40. And that's owned by the Office of Drug and Alcohol Program Compliance, which is, you know, U.S. DOT and not specific to any agency. And the regulation, you know, covers, you know, primarily transportation employer service agents, such as collectors, laboratories, medical review officers, substance abuse professionals. It also covers transportation employers. And the role that is most defined by Part 40 is the designated employer representative, otherwise known as the DER, which is the entity which is regulated under Part 40 that's an employee that you have, whether you're a transit administration, an airline, you know, or a motor carrier. You have a DER, and that's the person who is able to relay with the MRO, get information, and then disseminate that information uh, throughout your organization. One important part is 40.11, you know, and paraphrase that says, ultimately, DOT holds you as the employer accountable for the work of your service agents. So if you have a service agent that isn't doing something he or she is supposed to do, DOT has very little action against them, but can take regulatory action against you. So now what is the DOT drug screen? It remains a five panel drug screen. However, there's not just five drugs being tested for it. So it's five basic classes of drugs. So the first class is amphetamines, which includes amphetamine itself, methamphetamine, and then ecstasy, ecstasy type metabolites, MDMA and MDA. It also looks for cocaine metabolite, THC metabolite, so delta-9 THC carboxylic acid metabolite is what it's looking for, and then opioids. And those opioids include, you know, morphine, codeine, heroin metabolite, and as of 2018, also includes oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, and hydromorphone. And the last is PCP. 
And this five-panel drug screen, when it was initially propagated, was basically looking for illicit drugs. The reason that it had amphetamine screening in it is it was looking for methamphetamine, and, and amphetamine screening is, is how you get there. You know, cocaine and THC, of course, are, are self-explanatory. Opiates, so the reason codeine, morphine were added, you know, were part of the panel, is because they're both markers of heroin use and are actually in the urine far longer than heroin metabolite. And then the last one being PCP is also self-explanatory. So the overview of the drug screening regulation, um, as well as alcohol screening regulation, you know, I, I'm all often remiss in not talking enough about alcohol testing. You know, alcohol is the number one drug of abuse in the United States, and it can't be, you know, understated the negative impact that it has, you know, on safety. Um, but for drug screening, there's, you know, five primary reasons for it. It's a pre-employment drug screen. That's not exactly a great, you know, wording for it. You know, you may have an employee that currently is a non-regulated employee that now, you know, he or she gets their CDL and it's now part of the FMCSA drug screening program. They're not being, it's so to speak, not a pre-employment program, but it's a pre-placement into a, a DOT-defined safety-sensitive uh, role, which requires drug screening. Next is random programs. The third is post-accident uh, program. And the trigger event that causes you to run a DOT post-accident, it varies depending upon the agency. There's two test types that are used after a person violates a DOT drug screen, but an employer is bringing them back to duty. Um, and that's the you know, re return to duty test and follow-up test. Return to duty and follow-up drug screens have the requirement to be observed. So please do not use return to duty as the reason for a drug screen if a person breaks their ankle playing softball, is off of duty for four months, you remove them from the random list, you know you have to do a new pre-employment you know, pre drug screen on him, you have to place him back into your uh, random pool do not use return to duty. Please use pre-employment or pre-placement, as I say. And then the last is reasonable suspicion testing. Alcohol testing, same sort of rules. The big difference between drug and alcohol testing is there is no mandate under DOT for a pre-employment alcohol test. However, all the other reasons, you know, and, and the kind of talk track is the same from a random post-accident return to duty and follow-up perspective as well as reasonable suspicion. The DOT examination requirements, I'm just gonna to touch briefly on this, and it's really less about examination requirements and how they interplay with uh, the drug screen. So under part 40, there are basic two safety concern protocols. One is 40.327 which is an immediate safety concern protocol. And you know, since I got into the industry in 2001, the wording has remained the same, which me, as an MRO, if I find out that a donor is on a medication or has a medical condition, which may be considered medically disqualifying under a DOT agency medical standard, I must, and, and that word is must, so it's not maybe or if you consider it or, you know, do, you know, with your judgment, it's really you must relay a, a safety concern, you know, to the employer uh, on, you know, right after that interview. Um, so that that's, you know, what I inherit, what the regulation stated uh, when I got into the industry. And the three agencies, again, that have a medical standard are Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, U.S. Coast Guard, and FAA for pilots. Those are the, the three agencies that have mandated medical standards. Well, pursuant to uh, the rule change uh, 
or the panel change, excuse me, in 2018, um, ODAPC received comments. And many people commented uh, stating that, well, if my company knows that I use oxycodone eight times a day to control my low back pain, um, that company may just fire me and not, you know, not even consider me for employment. So if there isn't a medical standard in place, so for transit, the standard FAA employee that, that is not a pilot, you know, federal rail, and pipeline hazardous material safety administration. If I, as the MRO, believe that the use of a person's medication could impact their ability to work safely, I, by regulation, have to give the donor seven days, i.e. five business days, for him or her to talk to his or her treating physician to get medical clearance. And that medical clearance kind of has three flavors. One, you know, my patient, Sally Jones can use her hydrocodone as prescribed without any safety concern. You know, my patient, Sally Jones, is being switched from hydrocodone to meloxicam for control of her pain. Or my patient, Sally Jones, isn't, you know, isn't, you know, uh, qualified or isn't safe to do a safety-sensitive DOT position. Really comes in that way. But I have to provide the donor that seven-day period to provide me that information. So again, the voicing safety concerns very much is you know based upon agency. So 327 is the immediate safety concerns for motor carrier FAA pilots and U.S. Coast Guard. All the rest of DOT has that latent safety concern which I have to give the person seven days to get information back to me. If they don't get the information back to me in seven days, I can voice the safety concern. And, of course, I can voice the safety concern earlier if the donor doesn't want to go to his doctor and get that information or that information comes back and there's a, you know, a safety concern based upon what, what his or her physician said. So just on this slide, I'm going to have the next slide will really go through the 40.135 process flow. But the process flow here is I as the MRO, number one, get a lab, you know, confirm positive result. When I'm talking to the donor, if that donor, John Driver, admits, you know, or, you know, admits to using hydrocodone um, by prescription, so he has a legal, pres legal verifiable prescription um, for his chronic, you know, knee pain, you know, once I ver you know, I can verify that information, make it a negative drug screen. But since John Driver is a truck driver pursuant to the FMCSA medical standards, I have to relay a safety concern saying, you know, John Driver is on hydrocodone. You know, um, you know, treating physician medical clearance is required. As a best best practice recommendation for anybody who has, you know, employees that have a medical standard. You know, you should get a note from the treating physician that says, yes, I'm aware of John Driver's duties as a FMCSA safety-sensitive employee, and I believe John Driver is safe to operate and use commercial vehicle with that use of medicine. That may be part of, of Mr. Driver's, you know, FMCSA exam. So if you do get the, you, those exams and review them, uh, you may see that language within the exam. And if you see that language within the exam, um, you, you're primarily covered. And when you get that letter, what I do is rec recommend that you keep it in file and then, you know, separate from a DQ file, but within a confidential file and get it updated annually. It's, uh, you know, your regulation for drug screening, which is 382, 49 CFR 382, allows you as the employer to ask people, you know, the medicines that are on and get that medical clearance. So that, that's the, you know, immediate safety concern um, flow. So when there is no medical qualification in place, so it's under 40.135, and I'll just say, you know, it, the, the person will be Sally Transit. So Sally is a bus driver or a light train operator for a transit administration. There's a laboratory confirmed positive. You know, Sally alleges and has a prescription for hydrocodone which she uses for her chronic knee pain. Um, when I talk to her, she uses her hydrocodone, you know, at least three times a day. 
um, and therefore it's chronic use and hydrocodone can impact the person's ability to work safely. So therefore, you know, I can verify her you know, prescription. I can have a negative drug screen for her, but I have to give her seven days in which to, uh, you know, provide me uh, medical safety information. Upon receiving that medical safety information, my office uh, does, you know, so to speak, verify it with the source so we don't, we don't just allow anybody to send us in something that they may have checked box themselves. Um, so we do obtain that information. And if there is that information, all you're reported is a negative drug screen. And I can't report to you that, you know, Sally is on hydrocodone because I've resolved the medical safety issue internally. So now let's talk about DOT random programs. So again, a random program, as we all know, is the essential part of the DOT Drug Street Workplace Program. It's a vital component for deterrence. You know, the employees selected have to be through a scientifically validated random selection tool. The frequency of you know, selections, so to speak, isn't mandated, but essentially is mandated. Uh, you know, it needs to be throughout the year with an equal chance of every selection period for everyone in that pool to be selected. Um, and therefore, depending upon, you know, your company size, uh, if you're a smaller company, you may be part of a consortium where multiple companies are, are, live in one pool and that every company in that pool has to remain compliant to those selections because if one, person, one company isn't compliant, the whole consortium is not compliant. You know, as you know, you get you know larger pools of employee. You'll you'll essentially live in your own pool, where your your selections will be made. And again, most companies run them quarterly. Some very large entities run them monthly. So it's really up to you. But the period that you know you have to have periodicity, and everyone has to have an equal chance of being selected throughout the year. Therefore, you can't, so to speak, I'm going to do all my random drug screens in first quarter so I can get it done. So I have 500 you know, covered employees. I'm selecting at a 50% rate. I'm going to do 250 random tests at the beginning of the year, and then I won't be bothered with it for the next three quarters. That's not a compliant program. Essentially, you have to spread the, that 250 results out over all four quarters you know again employees need to be need to be eligible for selection throughout the entire period you know federal transit administration where they have a lot of transit facilities that are 24 7 you know uh so to speak transit operations if 50 percent of your employees work after hours fda expects that 50 percent of those people are going to be selected and you can't say well these are third shift people we really don't we're always going to pull an alternate if if that person is selected because it's just a hassle getting getting that person a breath alcohol test at two in the morning again you know what fda expects is that you do get a breath alcohol technician out there at two in the morning and test that person either immediately before during or after his or her shift you know, testing should be unannounced. So therefore, you know, when I was in private practice, uh, one of the large employers wasn't DOT, but on their employee calendar set, had on their drug testing day. And for some reason on drug testing day, they had a high absenteeism rate. But again, you cannot have these announced. You shouldn't have them in a way that employees can predict, you know, when selection. So if you select quarterly, don't notify everybody and send them for testing the first week of the month or first week of the quarter spread those out throughout the entire so that you have the ability that someone who's selected you know in the quarter quarter one selection that a certain amount of those random selections are happening on march 30th and 31st um you know once a, a employee is notified of the random test all the actions of that employee should bring them to the collection site. So if you select, I'll use John Driver again, John Driver should immediately proceed to the collection site. 
John Driver shouldn't be allowed to say, well, you know, I'm, you know, here and I, you know, I can, you know, do this and maybe I can wait until the end of the day and get it done then. Again, you, you know, you need to, so to speak, reinforce that, hey, John, you've been selected. I see you're in Wichita. We have a concentra in Wichita. You can go ahead and go there, um, you know, and, and run from there. Um, you shouldn't go, well, John, yeah, that's fine. You know, when you're at the end of the day in Omaha, get it done then. You know, because now John has plenty of pr- uh, prep time to get ready for that test. And what you're trying to do is minimize, uh, so to speak, people studying for that drug test. And then once again, random alcohol tests can only be done immediately before during or immediately after performance of safety sensitive duties. So, you know, if a driver works a standard work week, Monday through Friday, do not call them up on Saturday and say you have an alcohol test, because even if that alcohol test comes back at a a violation, you can't take action on it because the person wasn't driving, you know, wasn't driving for you that day, wasn't performing safety sensitive work on, on his day off. So just be aware that, um, you know, it has to be immediately before, during or after. And then, Fed, you know, the pipeline administration, the FIMSA group doesn't even have a random testing requirement for alcohol. So, you know, one DOT agent doesn't, agency doesn't require random alcohol testing. And that really goes to the next slide. So Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, which by far is the largest uh, administration in regards to covered employees uh, and employers, you know, they select at a 50% drug rate and a 10% alcohol rate. Uh, FAA, through the time I've been in the industry, has been at 25% and 10%. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but you can see the uh, attendant rate uh, for all of the all of the agencies here under USDOT, um, so that's you know that's the you know so to speak the the DOT rate. I believe U.S. Coast Guard is also a fifty and ten percent as well. Um, they they took that out because you know, our our compliance team doesn't view them as DOT, even though they consume out of the DOT set of rules. So best practice recommendations for post-accident. So, again, the post-accident you know, program basics are, are there's essentially a trigger event. Something happens with, which you know, then causes you to have a, a post-accident uh, drug screen and alcohol test. Um, that trigger event is defined differently depending upon the agencies. There is a time frame to get that done. Um, there's some very slight differences between the agencies with FRA really being different than everyone else. And if testing can't be completed within that testing window, the company needs to maintain a record showing all reasonable efforts. And if you maintain that record of all reasonable efforts, there shouldn't be any regulatory concern for you. Your DOT says you got to try. So if someone, you know, breaks, you know, ha- has a, you know, accident at 3 in the morning in parts unknown Wyoming, and you spend the, you know, the next, you know, eight hours trying to get an alcohol technician to him or her, and you try multiple ways to get it and no one can go there, maintaining that record showing that you couldn't get the alcohol test done is compliant to regulation. What isn't compliant to regulation is to say, well, this was in parts unknown Wyoming, and I don't ever have luck there, so I'm not even going to try. So, again, what they want to do is, you know, have you show all efforts to get that done. So the post-accident trigger events, you know, the largest agency, Federal Motor Carrier, you know, if there is a crash, and that crash causes a fatality, post-accident testing for drug and alcohol is mandated. If there is a FMCSA reportable accident, i.e. a vehicle tow away or off-site injury care, 
Um, there also needs to be a citation uh, the, uh, to the driver. The driver needs to be cited. Just because someone gets in a uh, FMCSA reportable accident does not mandate them to get, a, uh, so to speak, FMCSA mandated post-accident test. The only reason for you know that test is again fatality, and the driver is cited with it being an FMCSA reportable accident. And then who is selected, of, of course, is the driver. Transit administration, again, a little bit different. You know, if there's a fatality, yes, person needs to be tested. And then any accident where covered employees' performance may have caused the accident. So you'll see this is a trend with the other agencies. So if there's an accident and somehow the covered employee may have caused that accident, that then that person is, is tested from a post-accident perspective. So again, who's tested? The covered employee operating the transit vehicle, whether it's light train, bus, um, van, whatever. And then other covered employees may also be tested. So if you know there was an accident and the wheel fell off the bus and caused it to careen into a car causing a fatality, well, maybe the, the mechanic is also tested that just worked on the tire. So, uh, or the dispatcher who dispatched, you know, two vehicles that ended up running into each other. You know, so FTA has, has more safety-sensitive categories than motor carrier, which is an agency that a lot of people say is, is an equivalent agency. So there's, you know, if all of a sudden the dispatcher may have done something wrong that could have been the cause of that accident. The transit authority uh, employer needs to have that dispatcher also tested from a post-accident perspective. You know, FAA, you know, again, accident, serious injury, substantial damage. You know, if there's an airline accident, you know, these are big deals. This is, you know, front page USA Today. Um, and who's tested as any surviving employee that you cannot rule out or completely discount that their actions may have caused that accident. So again, you know, certainly pilots are going to be the ones that are most intimately involved in this. But there, it may extend to weight and balance people or mechanics as well. Central pipeline and hazardous material, um, you know, reportable incidents under, you know, 49 CFR 191 and 195. So again, since these are pipeline employees, any any pipeline accident, any unintended leakage of fuel or leakage of gas, any of those things are really causes for it. And again, you know, these also are, you know, front page news events. So it's any, you know, surviving employee that, that may have contributed you know, or cannot be completely discounted, you know, is tested. Um, you know, U.S. Coast Guard, so Department of Homeland Security, but again, the rules that they follow are under DOT, is really a serious maritime incident. So discharge of fuel, fatality, injuries, vessel damage, and, you know, personnel where their negligence can't be ruled out. And then FRA is probably a half an hour discussion in and of itself of the variety of different trigger events after a rail incident that mandates that. So if there's any FRA employers, uh, you should be aware of them. It, you know, uh, if you're a high right client, I can certainly walk you through those, but it, it's a fairly extensive algorithm. So the requirement for post-accident, so an accident happens. Everybody other than Federal Rail essentially has eight hours to get the alcohol test done and 32 hours to get the drug stream done, and you have to document all reasonable efforts to get those testing done. However, Federal Rail is different. You know, they want testing within four hours. They will test cadavers. So I'm not going to go through line by line here, but as you can tell, Federal Rail you know, takes a, a great deal of extra effort documenting all of the different things that need to be done after an accident uh, perspective, which is really, you know, um, 
makes some sense because one of the watershed events that caused the Reagan administration to move forward with the DOT drug testing was a train accident in, in Maryland. So FRA has many more kind of rules around their post-accident incident testing. So DOT best practices for reasonable suspicion. So again, you know, reasonable suspicion are that an employee has to, you know, go for a test, whether drug, alcohol, or both, if a supervisor believes that the person is demonstrating um you know, actions or behaviors that, that lead them to believe that, that the person's impaired from either drug or alcohol. Reasonable suspicion means that, you know, one or more trained supervisors reasonably believe that a covered employee is under the influence of drug or alcohol. They cannot require testing based on a hunch or a guess. You can also not compel testing to get someone's significant other calls and says, you know, Sally Transit, I know she's, you know, uses methamphetamine and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm divorcing her because of her methamphetamine use. You, you can't, you know, that's not the cause for a DOT reasonable suspicion test. So allegations aren't it. You have to have, you know, the following, you know, must be based upon observations of appearance, behavior, speech, and, and body odor, and they have to be articulable, i.e., you have to be able to name what they are, and contemporaneous, meaning they're happening right now. Not something that, well, I saw Sally out, you know, on last Saturday, and she looked funny, and now it's Monday morning, and I think Sally does drugs, so I want to do a test. That's not a, a contemporaneous observation. It happened two days ago. You can't use that to compel a test. So again, all reasonable suspicion training is based upon essentially one or more trained supervisors uh, that, you know, basically define or, or say that this person has articulable, you know, contemporaneous observations of appearance, behavior, speech, or body odor, which lead them to believe that the person is impaired by drug or alcohol. So supervisors, all DOT agencies mandate supervisor training, and supervisor training is, is, you know, the same across the board. There needs to be 60 minutes on controlled substances, 60 minutes on alcohol. The training needs to include those articulable observations of controlled substance, you know, you know or alcohol, you know, impairment. Um, and the training only needs to occur once. So if you're a supervisor and you've gone through that training and you have a training certificate from, you know, 1999, you have fulfilled your requirement. The DOT is, is silent on that. You know, ODAPSI is silent on return training. The agencies are, are essentially silent. The FAA, however, you know, in a statement believes that it's a best practice for uh, you know, people that fall under FAA to have this type of reasonable suspicion training every 12 to 18 months. You know, when I look at it as a best practice, I would say, you know, some form of periodicity, whether you do it every other year, every three years, every five years, you know, you as a company need to define, you know, you know that periodicity for you because you want to keep this top of mind. You know, especially today with the emergence of all the, the decriminalized recreational marijuana, uh, you, you want to show that you're taking this seriously. So if, you know, someone, I'll, I'll, I'll just use motor carrier, you know, someone who's a motor carrier, you know, gets in an accident, someone dies, that, that post-accident drug screen is positive for Delta 9 THC. Now you have a plaintiff attorney saying, well, you should have known this and stopped this. Well, then showing that, hey, we have an annual supervisor training where we go over this every year in terms of the signs and symptoms, that will show that you're not disregarding, you know, uh, so to speak, um, or, or not taking seriously a safety culture. And it's that taking seriously of safety culture that keeps you from getting, you know, punitive damages.
I, I apologize. I think I clicked the button twice. Um, so reasonable suspicion guidance. So an employer show requires someone to submit to a drug and or alcohol test. You know, when the employer believes that person is showing signs of impairment and those, that impairment is based upon articulable contemporaneous observations of appear, appearance, behavior, uh, you know, body odor and such, um, you know, and from that perspective, you know, what you want to do is, you know, immediately remove that person from duty and then send that person, you know, for testing. So those are the, the real caveats of a reasonable suspicion program. Next, there should be a written record. So it shouldn't just be, you know, a June and, and Bob's supervisor um, say, yeah, we, we saw Sally and she, she had, you know, she was slurring her words. Uh, she had bloodshot eyes, um, you know, she was you know, walking, you know, um, you know, walking in an unsteady way. They shouldn't just remember that. They need to document that and have it on, on a worksheet or have it as part of a statement. Um, and, and essentially those two supervisors should, you know, um, agree on what those articulable contemporaneous observations are. You know, generally, DOT wants two supervisors, at least one of them trained, ideally both of them trained, to be making these observations. However, in limited circumstances, you know, particularly when you know, at a given site where there's just not two supervisors, there's just one supervisor on the third shift that, you know, they'll allow just one supervisors to document the, so to speak, trigger event and compel the testing. You know, information conveyed by third parties of a driver's use cannot be used. So again, you know, the, the significant other, you know, a client saying, you know, uh, John Driver looked bad. I, I think you need to have a testing. You can only compel that testing based upon your, you know, observe specific contemporaneous articulable observations of appearance, speech, body, over behavior. So again, it needs to be yours, not someone else. And again, you know, if an alcohol test is, should be administrated within two hours, if it's not within two hours, um, you know, you need to give them up to eight hours. If it can't be done after eight hours, you know, you you cannot compel the test any further. The testing window is closed. However, you do need to remove the, the donor from duty and place them out of service for a day. You know, the controlled substance test, there isn't a, so to speak, time frame on this of like for, for um, post-accident where it's 32 hours. You have to make every effort to get the person in for testing as soon as possible. So those are the two big differences between alcohol and drugs. So again, the general process flow for you know any employment-based alcohol test is really there's an initial test. If that initial test uh, shows a confirmed alcohol concentration of less than 0.02, um, you know that person can continue with work. If the you know, confirmation test is equal to 0.02 or over, you know, now it really is, okay, the confirmation test it, you know, shows, shows less than 0.02, that person can return to work. Um, if it's between 0.02 and 0.04, um, but not 0.04, you, know, you have to remove that donor from safety sensitive duties for essentially one day, and then they can return to work. And if it's, you know, equal to 0.04 or more, you have to remove that driver from safety-sensitive duty. You have to advise that driver that they had a violation under DOT rule and that that violation, um, you know, causes them to have a SAP requirement. And then whatever your employee you know, or your employment attorney says you do with those violations, whether you terminate or allow them, you know, to go to a SAP and return to duty. You know, the employment action DOT is silent on, but what DOT says 
is you have to remove them from DOT safety sensitive positions. The next part here, you know, from a controlled substances perspective, you know, we know that it's, you know, collected, sent to the lab, you know, the lab does its thing, the MRO does his or her thing. If it comes back negative, they can return to duty. If it comes back negative with a safety concern, you need to address that safety concern, you know, as soon as possible. And my basic recommendation is remove them from duty until you have that safety concern resolved. Because you know, if you have a driver who is using a controlled substance, that before you get the you know, safety concern resolved, you know, runs their fuel truck into the orphanage, you know, no one after the fact is going to say John Driver was safe to drive. They're going to, uh, everybody's going to, you know, say, oh, no, we knew he wasn't safe to drive. We didn't know he was a driver. So, again, you want to resolve that safety concern, you know, before, you know, uh, John or before John continues to drive. Um, but again, that's up to you and, and your company policy. You know, if it's positive, you know that that MRO verified positive, you know, results in removal from safety sensitive duty and the requirement to go to a, a SAP, te- you know, uh, uh, SAP, substance abuse professional evaluation. What you do for an employment purpose, again, is completely up to you. Again, donors from a DOT drug screening perspective do have the opportunity to ask for a split specimen, you know, in my career, I've only had one DOT split specimen that failed to reconfirm, and that's a big deal where I have to generate a report to the Office of Drug and Alcohol Program Compliance. Um, so, again, it, it's it's highly unlikely that the split specimen uh, won't reconfirm. And, again, you know, the driver, you know, whoever the driver or, you know, safety-sensitive employee, before they can return to safety-sensitive duties, does need to go through that, you know, SAP evaluation, return to duty, and and follow-up testing requirements. So now the the last grand finale, and Justin appears that there will be a uh, a few minutes for questions. You know, we know that, you know, in September 2009, as of January 1st, 2020, oral fluid was approved as a federal specimen. Well, it essentially took the DOT to May of 2023 to say, yeah, we we believe, you know, our, you know, our people can use it, that DOT will approve this specimen. But, but right now, as of June 1st, you could have started using it. But you really can't because, you know, DOT is requiring two labs to be accredited. And the lab and collection device that that lab used needs to be accredited by the National Lab Accreditation Program, NLCP. And there's no labs that are accredited right now. It is believed that there won't be a lab accredited till very late in this year and more plausibly potentially Q1 to Q2 next year so oral fluid is great specimen i'm very bullish on oral fluid it has some great science behind it It has uh, a great risk mitigation effect you know what collector training looks like is still to be determined because that collector training will be based upon the collection device that nlcp ultimately um so to speak certifies but again you know this is something that i encourage all dot employers to look at and work with your third-party administrator in regards to, hey, when this becomes available, send us more information and help us out how we can deploy such a program. Um, because, again, it, it's, it, it's a very you know, powerful specimen that can be used in a lot of different use cases, um, pre-employment, random, po- you know, it's going to be approved for all the different use cases. DOT isn't coming through and limiting those. So again, how you can deploy that in your program, um, you know, I encourage you to look into. You know, here's the kind of sundry nuances, though. You know, number one, the, the employer decides what specimen is to be used. So therefore, you can say, hey, I'm John Driver, I want to do a urine test. And now, you know, Sally Transit, the employer there says, I want to do oral fluid test in this use case. So you decide the specimen based upon the use case. You know, oral fluid is the preferred specimen uh, for observed specimen collections, 
and is the mandated specimen if a DOT covered employee you know admits that they're transgender. So since you know for an observed collection, so if you have a person who is a transgender, um, you know you have to do oral fluid testing if there is an observation requirement. So that person has an invalid result on his or her urine test. They identify as transgender. That immediate rescreen needs to be done in oral fluid. So every DOT employer needs to have an oral fluid account for those situations. Um, next, kind of the unknown is what collector training will in entail. You know, I worked with ATA on their comments. Um, and one of the comments were is right now you can become a, a certified oral fluid collector by doing a video course that is less than 10 minutes. Um, ideally, there should be such a course that it's easy to get uh, approved to be a uh, collector for oral fluid because collecting oral fluid is essentially the same as watching someone brush their teeth. And in fact, the, the actual donor handles all of the supplies and, and things and really the collectors just there to witness the collection and certify that that's the donor's test and handle the chain of custody so i believe the training should be you know it shouldn't be a, a, as stringent as urine because urine has all sorts of rules around what if it comes out with you know urine that quantity or quantity not sufficient urine or cold urine or hot urine so again, I think oral fluid collection is an easier process. You know, drug testing industry unknowns is, you know, if you want to use collection sites, what is the collection site network going to look like? You know, right now, higher right, we support over 26,000 collection sites nationwide. There's probably, you know, less than a thousand that collect oral fluid at this time. Um, you know, but that in all likelihood will increase as, you know, DOT testing, you know, it is able to use this. So there's now accredited labs. And then what will be the cost of that collection, you know, at a third-party site? You know, will it be as expensive as urine? Will it be more expensive than urine or will it be less expensive? That's still an industry unknown. And then, you know, you have your normal industry roadblocks. You know, what what's your collective bargaining agreements with your unions going to look like? You know, are you willing to train, uh, train collectors? Do you have to go into your policy and, and add oral fluid language to it? Hair testing, you know, remains at a stall. There's been a couple different goes for hair testing. Um, you know, DOT did propagate a rule, which wasn't a very good rule, a few years back that industry didn't really like. There's been, you know, motor carrier groups that have tried to push it through in, in various flavors that have been unsuccessful. There is supposed to be pending a new rule for hair to be released. I haven't seen that as of yet. So from that perspective, um, you know, right now hair testing isn't, you know, isn't approved for DOT. If you do hair testing, which I believe has a great risk mitigation value, you know, particularly as a adjunct to your, you know, DOT test as a company policy pre-employment test. Again, that's still being done under your company authority, and it's not a DOT or, or federally approved specimen. And final DOT, you know, regulation information. Again, this is really, you know, for you. So depending on what agency you are, if you want to write down, hey, I'm a motor carrier, write down 49 CFR 382, and then take the half an hour to read that regulation just to kind of understand the different moving parts of it. So, again, I'll leave this up for people to just uh, digest a bit uh, to take a look at. And again, just know that, you know, 49 CFR Part 40 is the overarching um, regulation that all of these regulations take bits and parts of. And that Part 40 really is the framework of collection, testing, MRO practice, substance abuse professional practice. Any 
And now, Justin, I, it looks like we have five minutes left, so if there's any Q&A you would like to address. Yes, Dr. Simo, we have a lively uh, group of questions that have come through, and certainly we'll get that information out to the attendees as well. We certainly won't have time to engage them today. One question, though, seems to uh, have been asked more than once pertains to reasonable suspicion. Uh, and to sort of summarize, the general concern is starting – is there a DOT checklist or some sort of official process that needs to be engaged when documenting a reasonable suspicion concern? And you did go over some of those elements here. Do you have anything else you'd like to expand on that with? Well, again, from, a, you know, each agency has kind of propagated, a, you know, a rule, but all of them require, number one, that you make a written record of your articulable contemporaneous observations of impairment. They don't define what that written record looks like. I'm a big fan of, you know, check, you know, uh, you know, uh, so to speak, forms that have check boxes, because then, you know, that allows people to go, oh, yeah, hit, you know, uh, John Driver's eyes were red and he smelled of marijuana and he was speaking slowly. I mean, they can go through and kind of check those as well as having a free form area because not everything uh, fits into a checkbox perspective. Um, you know, any, anybody can go online and look, there are several organizations that actually publish their, um, their document online. So you could go through and go, wow, I really like this document and, and you know, create your own document based upon it. Um, you, we don't have a particular document, nor have I seen any of the DOT agencies going, this is the document, you know, this is FAA Form 182, that is how you document reasonable suspicion. I haven't seen such a form. All of them do require a trained supervisor, ideally two trained supervisors, to document you know, in a written record and sign that document, and that should be essentially be ready before the, even the test results come back. So you should have that written record before you get the alcohol test back. So you don't change it as you go. Well, they really didn't smell of alcohol. I think they smelled more of marijuana. You need to have that record done before the testing events are completed. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a great explanation. One more question uh, before we exceed our time today. And this one seems to have come up a few times. I think it's probably relevant. I know you can give a, a quick summary of engaging higher right uh, when there are various different challenges with drug tests from anything uh, to missing signatures to, to uh, you know, documents not being legible and so forth. Could you give us a quick just rundown for our customers on the line here today on the best ways to engage higher right when uh, we do have things that need to be evaluated with regard to process and performance of a drug test? No, certainly. So our, you know, our platform itself, you know, we'll see, you know, things will come in and old will say pending MRO. Well, there's several things that fall under pending MRO. Some of them fall under pen, pending MRO because we need to get, you know, a legible copy of the copy two, it's, you know, or legible copy of a copy one or its equivalent. We do have pending CCF is something which basically means we're waiting for a, a legible copy of the copy two. Um, but pending MRO also may be an affidavit. You know, we can't say, oh, we're missing the affidavit. If all of a sudden, you know, customer service call, you know, call in the customer service, the, you know, you know, un unfortunately, there's not a lot of transparency that we can give to those issues just because DOT essentially, from an MRO perspective, doesn't allow me to be as transparent as I would like to be, you know. Pending MRO means it may be positive and waiting for the donor to call. It may be we need an affidavit from the collection site. You know, we're working through those things to get them done on your behalf to, to get you that result. Unfortunately, there's not, based upon DOT regulation, a lot of transparency there. It's the same way that, you know, a person is positive for Delta 9 THC, you know, I can't give you the the level of THC by regulation unless it's going through some sort of litigation process. So, you know, DOT has a lot of parameters of 
certain amount of the MRO practice and, and what we need to perfect the drug screen, you know, needs to be kind of in, in, in the black box that, the, that you can't peer into so you don't have a biased hiring decision. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Simo. And that will bring us to the conclusion of our allotted time today. I do want to encourage everyone to please take the survey and give us your commentary. We did receive quite a few questions, which we will endeavor to make sure we push out answers to those if we haven't been able to engage them uh, here today. And on behalf of Hyrite and the entire staff here, we appreciate your business and we thank you for your interest here today. And thank you, Dr. Simo, for your expertise. No, thanks, everybody on the phone. Have a great day, everyone. Take care, everyone.